You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, join us on the Pirate History Podcast. There is a ship in the glistening harbor. It is the best that its country's navy has. And it comes in peace. Newspapers report its arrival. The officials of the city where it's in welcome it and host its captains at fine restaurants. Ostensibly, it is a floating symbol of the friendship between the old world and the new. That is, until an explosion happens. Now, you may only think you know the ship that I'm talking about, but in this case, I speak of the Spanish naval vessel, the Vizcaya, jewel of its fleet, such that it was, visiting New York City Harbor in 1898. The reason it is sent to New York is that there are some diplomatic kerfuffles between the nation of Spain and the nation of the United States, and after the United States felt that in the Spanish possession of Cuba, its citizens might be endangered, the United States was kind enough to send one of its warships, the USS Maine, to Havana Harbor. Aha, that's the ship you were thinking about, and it is relevant to our story, of course. Why not return the favor, though, and also remind this North American upstart nation that Spain is a nation of the world with considerable history, During the duration of the Vizcaya's stay in New York City, the New York Times says she will be under the protection of the New York City police, just as our treasured USS Maine is under the protection of Spanish authorities in Cuba. By courtesy, we admit her to our waters and pay politeness to her officers. But when there is news of the destruction of its American counterpart in Cuba, blown to pieces by a mine hundreds of American sailors dead, things get tenser. New York City is home to aggressive papers, with reporters hired to stir up their readers' imagination and their papers' circulation. Where there is a crumb of truth, a loaf of a story is created. Joseph Pulitzer operates his world full of sensationalist styles and a cartoon frenzy, including often a picture of a yellow kid with something on the yellow kid's person on their suit that'll often be the message. Very recognizable figure. So his rival newspaper owner, William Randolph Hearst, wants to create more shocking news stories and steal his rival's circulation. He even hires an artist who is drawing that yellow kid. Just kind of a fun-loving, bald-headed kid in an alleyway in New York City. I may have taken Pulitzer's paper's umph away if he did not get another artist to draw his own new yellow kid. Back and forth the papers go, blaring headlines, each more sensationalist than the other, and a term is born, the yellow press. New York City is the home of this yellow press, but there's nothing kiddish about their coverage of the increasingly belligerent situation in Cuba. They consider every action of Spain suspicious and highlight it in the worst context. Anything the Cuban rebels do rebelling against Spain, heroic. 
They heat up the rhetoric big time on the dishonor of an American naval vessel's destruction. And they downplay every step the Spanish government makes, every statement they make. And when a diplomatic cable where the Spanish ambassador calls McKinley weak is intercepted and released to the press, he's calling him weak against senators that are encouraging war with Spain, not weak in general, doesn't matter. Greatest insult to the United States ever is the headline. And amid this tension, the Vizcaya remains in New York Harbor. Yellow headlines suggest that it will soon train its own guns on the city. The Vizcaya will be called back to Spain. Its hull, the captain knows, is in poor condition. It barely makes the voyage across the ocean. And it will need to make one more trip across the ocean to fight for Spanish possessions again against many of the ships that it saw in its New York City voyage. It's unusual to see anything in the Spanish-American War from the Spanish side. The story of the Spanish-American War of April to July 1898 is usually one of U.S. imperialism, of Rough Riders and T.R. with his hat, and that is part of the story, of the Maine, of McKinley, of some of the opposing forces against imperialism like Mark Twain and Carnegie, and not much about Spain. After all, Spain was the loser in that war. It's a period in that nation's history that will be called the disaster and will lead to tensions, conflicts, re-examination of where that country's role in the world is. It'll lead to new politics, new literature and art, some say new imperialist expansions, and eventually a civil war of its own. Yet in many ways, it was already a nation in civil strife, and understanding Spain is a good way to understand how war came about. Starting with, Spain had its own yellow press, so to speak, even if it was not called that and if there was no yellow kid. Its papers boosted national pride about the history of its great navy, even if its modern-day leaders knew that there was little to be gained in such an exercise, that their army and navy today did not match up with those expectations. The Madrid newspapers talked about the upstart, greedy, immigrant nation that was the United States. And yes, a few comments were made about how Spain, with its historic powers, would easily defeat the Yankee Navy, how the Americans were just a bunch of greedy capitalists, too greedy to fight, and how the Spanish Navy would punish the land stealers and even attack Florida if war came. It was not as frequent as Polish's headlines, to be sure, but it was present. And more importantly, Spain used its public communications to try to rally the other Spanish-speaking nations of the Americas, its former colonies, which it saw some commonality with now against the United States. In other words, the English speakers, they will come for you next. Most rhetoric was saved for the Cuban rebels, who were supported by associations in New York and other parts of the United States. The Madrid press called for the absolute crushing of the rebellion that had resurfaced in Cuba, and for the Americans to do a better job at intercepting guns and other support than they had been doing. Rebellions in Cuba under Spanish rule had taken place in the 1870s, but they were put down. Partially the reason they are put down is that the island is promised more rights. The island is promised a form of autonomy. It's never implemented in the crazy Spanish politics that follow. Jose Martin decides by the early 1890s, while Grover Cleveland is president of the United States, the movement is much stronger. They won't be defeated as easily as they were in the 1870s. They could take the island. He sends down a message from New York, rolled in a cigar, that the revolution should begin. And it does. And this time, it was fierce and organized. Cuban rebels quickly became in control of parts of the island. In America, there are cheers for the rebels. William Jennings Bryan started to show Cuban independence flags at his rallies instead of the old silver and gold message. President McKinley was urged by many in his party, Henry Cabot Lodge, Roosevelt among them, to intervene. Back to Spain. The country, as we get to 1898, is divided, not just in two sides but in many ways. Its king had abdicated in 1873. 
He'd hardly control things as it was. A short-lived republic runs the country. Less than two years to be ousted by the military in a coup, followed by a counter-coup, and the eventual restoration of King Alfonso and a constitutional monarchy. But it wasn't so easy. The Carlists, who felt Don Carlos de Borbon was the true king of Spain. In fact, his forces control much of the peninsula of Spain up until his defeat in the Third Carlist War in 1876. His supporters, though defeated, are still agitating. And the direction they advocate in the Carlist is the more nationalist one. That means in support of Spain having world possessions, still being an empire. This forces the government's hand, and it gets even harder when the king of Spain dies. And his replacement is a boy too young to rule. So his mother, Victoria, becomes queen regent. She's British and doesn't have the same political support that the previous king had. Spanish politics, not unlike a lot of countries, have two main parties, the conservative and liberal parliamentary parties. There is a lot of corruption. There are boss systems across Spain where peasant votes are counted without them actually voting. The two parties even have something called the turno politico, where they simply share power and rotate between prime ministers of liberal and conservative. There are also socialists and workers' parties and workers' newspapers advocating and agitating to provide more rights for the working class to stop sending soldiers to fight for overseas possessions. The Liberal Party ostensibly is more sympathetic to their views, though in an establishment way. The Conservatives are in power in Spain. Takes a hard line on the possessions that Spain has left, and of all the Spanish possessions. Cuba is by far the most significant. It produces one quarter of the world's sugar. It balances Spain's budget. It is a significant contributor to both the ruling classes in Spain and those on the island who are Spanish descent, benefiting from the economy there. And here's the key to understand. Cuba is, in 1898, a part of Spain. It sends representatives to the Cortes. That's their parliament. The Spanish who live there are Spanish citizens. It is considered today, though it's far away from the Spanish mainland, as we would consider Hawaii. Yet it is across the ocean. The United States several times has different designs on it, uh, either in the official U.S. government, where there might be some interest, or in various filibusters or secret operations that the U.S. government either has to protect or mildly encourages. Our eye is on Spain. It's a lot of the Civil War. Some of the Confederacy, um, some elements of the Confederacy, their idea is that they'll form a relationship with Spain. And Confederates who are escaping from the Union get a good reception, get a good reception in Cuba after the war. So when rebellions open up for the second time, the Spanish view is that this is a rebellion that they wouldn't have if it wasn't for American businessmen in the U.S. and Cubans who had fled to New York and other areas. No quarter must be given. From the American point of view, Cuba's too close, might be able to tolerate a remaining historic colony. But an aggressive military campaign to put down a rebellion? Better do it quick, folks. See, it doesn't start with McKinley. When Grover Cleveland's president in 1896, right before leaving office, he issues a statement to Spain through his secretary of state that essentially says, you must resolve this and you must protect Americans who are on the island. But it's Grover Cleveland. He's a lame duck, generally not for wars or international action, and it's not answered. Spain is busy, and it's an important issue for Spain, Cuba. You know, this isn't some minor thing that they forget about. In fact, the Spanish government changes, and a national government with General Arsenio Martinez Campos, established by the Queen Regent. Campos is a hero for two reasons. He has defeated the Carlists and secured the Spanish peninsula for the current government. And he then goes to Cuba and settled the conflict in that island. He's like their Patton, their MacArthur, but also kind of their kind of their Colin Powell too. Like he goes to Cuba and he uses a mix of military force where needed, but also political settlement. And one of the things that he promises that there'll be autonomy. He's not able to deliver that. Nonetheless, 
for quelling these two disturbances. He is a hero in Spain. But pretty quickly, Campos realizes the 1894 revolution is not the 1878 revolution. It is stronger. It's better organized. It has much more popular support. A few political concessions, which people won't believe, isn't going to end the movement this time. The conservative party, Canovas, being the leader of that, doesn't agree, doesn't like Campos. Spanish politics are very cutthroat. Each of the parties are looking for a way to seize power, even if it goes a little against their ideologies. It's a it's your typical political situation like you might see in D.C. that's going on in Madrid at this time. And he seizes on Campos's failure and brings in a conservative government and then orders a hardline general, General Weiler, to go to Cuba and institute a policy of no quarter. He develops the Reconcentrado program where Cuban villagers, average people, are displaced of their homes and brought to a single line in Cuba where they can be protected by the limited Spanish force. And they can be watched. And then in the rest of the island, the rebellion can be dealt with. This is, in modern parlance, horrible for PR. But Spanish politics, the bloodthirsty battles in the Cortes, jumping on any mistake, there's no other option. We have to remember, even the battles between the Campos or the liberals or the conservatives are not the only dimension. There were still Carlists present who were waiting for their chance to get an absolute monarchy. Then there's liberals who were saying, we shouldn't be sending our boys to Cuba. We should be giving the island autonomy. This is about the honor of Spain. The prime minister makes it clear. This should color how we view the American actions because on McKinley's side, he's viewing things going on and... A lot of people in the United States would like to intervene. There are political forces. We mentioned Brian, Democrats, pushing the Republicans or at least looking for the Republicans to make a mistake. Most of Congress wants to support the Cuban rebels. There's bills that pass without McKinley being able to stop them. The Queen of Spain tries to make certain negotiations, make certain statements that are placating, but it's pretty much seen in Congress and seen among the Cuban rebels and perhaps by the McKinley administration that there's no teeth to these statements. I mean, we're working the diplomacy. The American ambassador in Spain is getting having very nice meetings. We're trying to accommodate, you know, what can be done. But as I discussed with Bob Mary, the author of President McKinley, who came on the show in 2017, it represents a decision, really, by McKinley of what he wanted to do. And it doesn't appear that McKinley wants war necessarily, but he does have an objective. That expansionist sentiment and impulse was latent under the surface and it sort of exploded once again with McKinley. It would have happened whether it was McKinley or not. There were a lot of intellectuals and politicians, um, Teddy Roosevelt, we've talked about definitely among them, Henry Cabot Lodge, his good friend, um, the um, the naval historian and strategist uh, Mayen. Uh, these were people that were visionaries and they saw the p- potential for America becoming a global power of the first rank. And they gloried, they, they thrilled to that concept. But Kinley wasn't in that camp. He, he, didn't, he wasn't a visionary. He, did, he wasn't a man of great imagination. He was a man who could see where events were going. He could see events and how they interacted and where they were going. And then he could shape them. And when he saw we had these tensions brewing with Spain over Spain's treatment of Cuba and the Cuban people to such an extent, such such instability that it could spill over into the Caribbean and even affect our interest in in our sphere of influence. He basically decided that Spain had to leave the Caribbean, either willingly or under military threat or pressure. So he put Spain in that position. He basically said, you got to end this war. you got to end this insurrection. And if you don't do it within a reasonable time frame, um, we don't, we can't, we're not responsible for what might happen. Mm-hmm. And the Spanish said, well, who the hell are you to uh, tell us uh, how to handle our own colonies? And, uh, but, and, and they pushed back. But he refused to yield to the pushback. Then there's a blow in Spanish politics. The conservative count of us is shot by an anarchist. He's mad about the execution of other anarchists who had thrown a bomb into a rally. The queen tries to keep a conservative government, but eventually, under pressure from the United States for a better policy in Cuba, has to turn the government over to the liberal party in Sagasta. He's a liberal. 
and he's been prime minister before. He's going to try to give autonomy to the island of Cuba, but even he can't do it quickly and not quickly enough for the Americans. The liberals find it even more difficult than the conservatives because they're normally attacked for not being nationalistic enough, not standing up for Spanish pride enough. So as you can imagine, they're a little hesitant to just jump in. Meanwhile, during the um, the reconcentrado is a real boom for the yellow press, for Hearst and the Pulitzer Papers. You know, I've seen a lot of sides of this, and I want to make it clear that there's also a lot of support in Congress for this. I already had some statements from Cleveland, Spain needs to watch in Cuba. But there are some real stories that are brought in the newspapers that influence American opinion. One is about a woman who was captured and brought to Morocco. And she's turned into like kind of an angel-like figure. And the other is a dentist who was arrested and shot by the Spanish. And his story is told in, in heroic terms by the writer Richard Harding Davis. Then you reach the point where the two ships are sent to the opposite harbors, where the insult is made to McKinley and leaked to the press, and where there's some statements by the Spanish that are good for the Spanish press, but not so good for American opinion. Eventually, Sagasta, the prime minister of Spain, is able to issue an autonomy policy for Cuba. McKinley does present it to Congress, but it's made clear on the island of Cuba that the Spanish there, forget about the rebels for a moment, the, the Spanish in Cuba make it clear they will not listen to the government in Spain on this issue even if autonomy is given. They form power military units. They even riot in the streets. And they attack newspaper offices in Cuba associated with the Liberal Party. This is how strongly Spanish on the island of Cuba feel about this issue. And it's so clear to the Americans that this autonomy policy, even if granted by some paper in Madrid, will not be enforced. It will not change the life of the everyday Cuban. It's also clear to the Cuban rebels. And then that explosion. You know, we've done a study in four parts now of the 1890s. And so I think it's clear that, that the decade begins with a premise. And any decade that's at the end of a century... There really is naturally a kind of look back and reflection. We certainly had that in the 1990s. And it's in 1889, right at the cusp, when a book appears on shelves, The Winning of the West. It covers the settlement by white settlers of the Allegheny Mountains. It tells the story of those who pushed out and defeated Indians. But it also goes into the history of the miraculous Anglo-Saxons from King Alfred to George Washington and their history. Its author leaves no doubt of how he feels that the spread of the English-speaking peoples all over the world into the waste spaces of the world has been not only the most striking feature in the world's history, but also the event of all others, most far-reaching in its importance. Best thing to happen to the world, according to this author of this popular book, and yet the winning of the American West, which its author sets ostensibly in the context of the 18th century, but truly means to speak about the 19th and the 20th. It really means to speak to the acknowledged end of the frontier. As America sees itself, as the 1890s began, we talked about Frederick Jackson Turner and his speech that the frontier was ended and that America needs to find a new frontier. It can't be finished. But the West was not won without heavy battle and vivid shootouts and war. War with merciless ferocity, hideous barbarity, but yet war with savages is the most righteous of all wars. It's all okay, this book says, because it's a statement against the warped, perverse, and silly morality that would preserve the American continent for the use of a few savage tribes. It's almost God's work, the rude settler who drove the savage from the land. So writes its author, Theodore Roosevelt, who, at least in the beginning of the decade, how different will it turn out, tells a friend that he's part of the literati now. He's just a writer. 
But if Roosevelt's writing about the land, it's there, Mahan, who writes about the sea. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Captain Morgan, Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we explore the real lives of these pirates. We examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. The real stories are a lot more complex and a lot more interesting than the stories most of us have been told. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, join us on the Pirate History Podcast. Hutchinson, Minnesota had some problems. For the adults of Hutchinson, the problem was the teenagers. They kept sneaking off at night to empty barns where they'd brace yourself, dance. Who knew what sort of sin and heavy petting and French literature these barn dances might lead to? No, the adults of Hutchinson, Minnesota did not approve. And neither, it seemed, did the devil. One summer night, Satan himself suddenly appeared in the middle of the dance floor, and the debauched teens ran in fear. He showed up at the next dance, too. For a few months, it seemed like you couldn't go to a late-night barn dance in Hutchinson without getting chased out by the devil, pitchfork in tow. Until one night, when a 14-year-old boy had the good sense to shoot him in the chest. At which point the devil was revealed, Scooby-Doo style but bloodier, to be the local Methodist minister, dressed in a costume and flown in from the roof by rope and pulley. This is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the accidents, mistakes, and bad ideas that helped misshape our world. Find us at ConstantPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. the same time he releases the influence of sea power upon history. Again, it's about a historical period, 1600 to 1783. But no one, no one fails to see the point. They're using history to beat up politics. It talks about a past, but makes this point. When Britain controlled the seas, it became a major world power. And the same must be true of America. Its chances in the offing. Build a large navy and dominate the world. Fail to do so, and you might be dominated, or at least you'll fail to dominate. If the West was won, it was time for a vision of American foreign policy that would have Americans all over the world. New markets required a merchant navy, a battleship navy, and here's the third part. And this is where I think we get into a lot of the events that we'll describe in this episode a network of naval bases and fueling stations to provide a realistic reach for that Navy. Secretary of the Navy Herbert Tracy, Benjamin Harrison administration, agrees with Mahan, and so does the Congress to a degree. And at the turn of the decade, it is Benjamin Harrison who is president, and he's able to get more battleships in the Navy and to get a steel Navy. He even uh, gets into a row with the nation of Chile, which doesn't seem like you know a country that's the size of the, the U.S. or equal, but they actually do present a challenge, at least in their area of the Pacific, with because their Navy is more modern. I talked about it on the Ohio vs. the World podcast. U.S. military had a huge drawdown of forces following the Civil War. It makes sense. There's a, from a few million to like 40,000 active Army, Navy, and Marines. We're really only fighting in the West with the occasional Native American conflict, the Navy is using ships from the 1860s despite huge advancements in modern warships. Harrison reverses this when it comes to the Navy. We talked to Bruce Carlson about the role of Benjamin Harrison as the father of the modern U.S. Navy. If you were writing a history of the U.S. Navy, I don't see how you could uh, ignore Benjamin Harrison. You know, in general, Benjamin Harrison does get... Uh, ignored a lot, doesn't he? But after the war, the U.S. really does go to a period described by some as the doldrums in terms of the Navy. It's very expensive to maintain a Navy. The Civil War was financed with debt. They can't continue that in the 1870s. And so um, the Navy really goes into disrepair. How can we really be a nation like this without a fleet that can service the whole country, that can communicate and unite the whole country? And um, there's a lot of propaganda around it. There's a lot of books 
um, by Mahan, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. The obvious point, no Navy, no power. Progress on a Navy starts with Chester Arthur, and um, it's just seen in the 1880s that we have to do this. He's going to see that Congress funds and commissions several cruisers, the Philadelphia, the San Francisco, the Baltimore, the Charleston, the Columbia, the Minneapolis. These um, steel vessels can survive out at sea without docking for 103 days. This means that you as a nation have the ability to project power. The key statistic for Harrison's presidency, the path that he sets, is that we go from having the 12th largest Navy to being in competition for the second by the time you get to the turn of the century, where we're you know, in competition for number two after Britain. That modern Navy was put to an immediate test in 1891. The U.S. and Harrison nearly go to war with the country of Chile. I'd never heard this story. Chile was a power in the region. They'd gone through a civil war in the United States backed the existing president's regime, but his side lost the war. Chileans were not happy with the United States, and Harrison had brought the very popular James G. Blaine into his cabinet as the Secretary of State, but Blaine was useless to Harrison. He's constantly sick. He's never in Washington, always resting and recovering in the Northeast. He finally would resign the summer before the election, 1892. But Harrison had to handle this foreign policy crisis largely alone. Bruce Carlson takes us through what is now known as the Baltimore Affair. Almost went to war. and It is interesting to think about at the time that Chile is actually a formidable potential foe and rival at that time. Chile, in terms of South American nations, was doing quite well. And they had a formidable Navy, maybe 10 ships, but very well built ships. Into this comes the Baltimore, which is sent, uh, you know, again, you know, preserving our interests. And like any good diplomatic tale, it must begin in a bar. True Blue Saloon. That's right. There's some kind of altercation and argument. And one sailor, a Charles Riggins, is stabbed and shot. At the same time, when this happens, the port police and a mob of Chileans go all around the city looking for any American sailors they can find. Another sailor is killed, and several of them are locked in jail, and there's reports that they are beaten and bayoneted. What would happen now if this were Americans? I mean, I don't think they could apologize fast enough, but that's the difference between having a military might and being where approximately where the, the U.S. was in the in the in the 19th century, we're still kind of a rival in some ways with, with Chile. But that's something that's going to change during the Harrison administration. So this all happens in September 1891. It is reported back to Washington. You know, Harrison is initially cautious. He doesn't want, he thinks, okay, we'll get an apology here. And the foreign minister of Chile, Amani Mata, replies with, uh, it's because you made threats that are unacceptable and you have the incident wrong and, 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 and a very hostile message is given to them. Harrison still waits. He says, maybe we'll get an apology and nothing's forthcoming and you get to January 1892. Benjamin Harrison in his December State of the Union address to the American people and to Congress is saying, you know, if we don't get satisfaction, we're going to take such action as is necessary. Does he mean war? That's not quite what he says, but it's a pretty strong statement. It's also a statement that, you know, we're not forgetting here. Then the foreign minister of Chile, Mata, goes to the Chilean Senate and says that the president's message is either erroneous or deliberately incorrect. And, you know, the translation in diplomatic language is you just called the president of the United States either a liar or stupid. In the middle of this, there's, an, there's an, an incident where Blaine collapses. He's really of no use. You get to January 25th, 1892, and Harrison delivers a special message to Congress on this topic. We must protect those who in foreign ports display the flag and protect our colors. At the same time, he's got uh, his Secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Tracy, supporter of a very active Navy, puts the Pacific Fleet on notice. They might have to get ready for something here. What happens is the very next day after Harrison's statement, you have Chile capitulates. They not only say, we're sorry, 
<laughs> but they say, you know, it's bending over backwards diplomatically. We could have your Supreme Court decide the fee. I believe the fee decided on was $75,000 in reparations for what happened. But Benjamin Harrison had taken a stand. And I think it's a foreign policy victory that if it were today and something like that happened, you know, that would be a very big deal in a presidency. Theodore Roosevelt loves it. He uh, thinks that this statement, this forceful statement from Harrison is important. And it could only happen. President can only make a statement like that because we had a Navy to back it up. So think about Benjamin Harrison in this line of presidents leading to what McKinley and then Roosevelt are going to do. And also think about Grover Cleveland. Now, Grover Cleveland is not by his nature, nor anyone would call him an imperialist. He doesn't agree to annex Hawaii, for instance. And this is a big sticking point with Republicans and a big difference between the two parties. On the other hand, it's not like he hands the keys back to the queen either, just simply uh, doesn't allow an American flag to fly over Hawaii just yet. There's a little backlash, and some Democrats note it, and they see an opportunity when a nation in the American hemisphere comes to Grover Cleveland for help, and that's Venezuela. Venezuela is disputing its border with British Guiana. It's not a dispute of much notice, really. It goes on for a while, but then gold is discovered. The British pushed their stake and where they thought their boundary of their country was. Venezuela disagrees, but it doesn't have enough of an army. Nothing. Nothing that could stand up to Queen Victoria. So it appeals to the United States. Grover Cleveland is in his second term. He sees a way to gain a bit of a foreign policy credibility. After all, he had refused that annexation. Now his chance. Plus, it seems right. Here he's helping the underdog. He's not being a big, aggressive bully. But politics, and the politics, a Democratic representative from Texas tells him, turn this Venezuela question up or down, Mr. President, north or south, east or west, gold money or silver money, and Venezuela is a winner. Cleveland, though not inspired by politics, has to mind it a bit. And there are politics out there. Henry Cabot Lodge attacks the president preemptively in the newspaper for not enforcing the Monroe Doctrine. Roosevelt pushes, the American people will not tolerate a European power on American soil. Nobody wants war with the British. But Cleveland does dispatch Secretary of State Richard Omley to write a forceful letter. Now that's all it is. This is just a foundational step, a little tiptoe into America enforcing its weight around the world. In fact, the British government, the prime minister, doesn't even answer it initially. It takes about six months. And when he finally does, he has his backup. This is not a, an, a Monroe doctrine matter, to the extent we even agree with that doctrine. This is not a doctrine matter. We're already in British Guiana. It's already an area we are. It's not an invasion of a new country. Initially refuses to say anything more about the matter. Grover Cleveland and his Secretary of State persist. And the British agree to a conference. A conference between the Americans, the British, and a neutral country. Yes, the Venezuelans are not invited. It's not a war. It's not even much of a concession. It's going to take a couple years to even get the conference. It's not going to stop British operations in Guyana. But the British had to answer the Americans in a satisfactory way. And that is something. As it'll turn out, by the time the Venezuela Commission meets and makes a settlement, no one's really reading the news much on that, because bullets have already started flying. June 20th, 1898, the USS Charleston, a cruiser 
along with three transport ships, arrived at the island of Guam. Most Americans wouldn't know where they were. But for those on the Pacific Fleet, it was an important coaling station. It was not American. It was under Spanish control, as it had been for 300 years since Magellan. When the American ships arrived, excited locals gathered at the shore. It's not every day they get to see the U.S. Navy. Among them, the port captain, Gutierrez, along with the paymaster, a surgeon, and some prominent merchants, including the only American on the island. The Charleston fired around at the forts in the harbor. They did not hit that fort, but they were intending to. It was their orders. But there was no return fire. Twelve more rounds are fired at the fort. None hit, but still no return fire. The Charleston crew might have been relieved that they had heard as part of their instructions that there might have been fierce batteries and a naval fleet. There's no fleet, but they're greeted with a very small boat. In fact, they can see the captain of the port, Gutierrez, and two others approaching the USS Charleston. As it turns out, they wanted to apologize for not having any ammunition which to return the salute that you have given us from the guns on your ship. The captain of the Charleston comes down, greets them, and informs them, you may not be aware, but Spain and the United States are at war, and therefore you are prisoners of war now. Fortunately, one of the travelers, the American merchant, is able to establish who he is and provide a birth certificate and the sailor's trust him, and they're able to get passage back to the island. The governor of the island refuses to comply with the Americans. Indeed, when the captain of the port sends a note to the governor to please send, we need ammunition to return the salute of these American Navy vessels that are visiting us. The reply that he won't see that comes from the governor is, if you comply at all with the Americans, you will be shot. He also sends this to the American merchant. Governor sends a note to the captain of the USS Charleston, I cannot resist your powerful forces, obviously, but I protest that this is violence. I have no information that war exists between our countries. The Americans are not pleased. They give him 30 minutes to surrender, which he does in protest. The 54 Spanish soldiers on the island turn in their arms, and the American flag goes up over the fort. That merchant, the only American on the island, is appointed governor temporarily, and a few of the Charleston sailors remain. That is the last of three centuries of Spanish rule. James Long, the Secretary of the Navy, was always keeping an eye on his ambitious young assistant secretary, Theodore Roosevelt. But this is after the USS Maine had exploded. And there was such a pace of investigations and a lot of visits from interested seven senators, people from the administration. All this had to be managed by the secretary. And when he saw the chance to take an afternoon off, he did. In his stead, Theodore Roosevelt sends a cable with commands to Admiral Dewey, head of the American Pacific Fleet, with instructions to proceed to the Philippines upon orders and to have ships ready and full of coal. Now, it is Long that actually sends the order when war is declared and the Philippines are to be attacked. And I don't know if that gets lost in history or not, but it is Roosevelt who has them ready. It takes three days for Dewey's fleet to go from De Penguan off Hong Kong to the Philippines, where the largest Spanish Pacific colony is. Dewey prepares his cruisers, his flagship, the Olympia, the Boston, the Raleigh, the Baltimore, the gunboats U.S. Concord and U.S. Patrol, and the armed revenue cutter Hugh McAuliffe, named after Treasury Secretary who had recently passed away, as well as some supply steamers. He's ready to go. Patricio Montojo is the commander of the Spanish Pacific Fleet. He's got some ships... His flagship, the Reina Cristina, the Isla de Cuba, the Isla de Luzon, are his major cruisers, but they're not in very good condition. He's got gunboats, the Don Juan de Austria, Queen was a Habsburg 
Don Antonio de Ula. He's also got the Castillo, which is an old wooden steamer in such bad condition that it actually has to be towed around. So it's little more than kind of a floating cannon. To multiply his firepower, he moves away from the city of Manila and to the south, to Cavite, where there is a shore battery of six guns. This is obvious. If a fleet is attacking Manila, you're going to be able to keep your broadside, your best fire, to the north to engage with them. If anyone's arriving at the Philippines at this time, and Dewey has some good maps, they're going to go through the Boca Chica, which is a shipping corridor. And it is between the peninsula of Bataan and an island, Corregidor Island, which is really guarding the harbor. That's in peacetime. But if ships of war were to come through there, there are some large batteries that would pummel the now trapped ships and would make it difficult for them to get through intact. Dewey avoids this and goes through the larger opening, the Boca Grande, which is rumored to be mined. He puts his ship, the Olympia, in the lead and stands on the deck as the American fleet passes through. They get a few shots fired at him, a few batteries fire and at long distance, nothing hits, they fire back, and they get ready to engage the Spanish fleet. Because the Spanish decided to remain in the south, Dewey has all the maneuverability that he needs. And he lines up his ships in a position where they are 5,000 yards away. Now, at this range, the Americans simply have better and more accurate guns. For a five-hour battle, not much of a battle. Spanish attempt to hit the Americans, very few hits. At one point, the Reina Cristina tries to get closer to the Americans to engage in more accurate gunning. And it is so pummeled with artillery that it's forced back. Dewey actually stops and breaks for breakfast, and by the time he comes back, the flagship, the Reina Cristina, and the Castillo are on fire. The other ships are taken, the shore batteries are silenced. Dewey sends a note to Manila, don't engage in any uh, battering of us, or we'll destroy your city. Seeing their Spanish fleet destroyed, they listen. The Americans have a victory in a place that most Americans have never heard of. He wires Washington. I am completely in control of the bay. Dewey does tell uh, his bosses in Washington, D.C., that I do not have soldiers to occupy the city. And he asks for reinforcements. In addition, he'll make one critical decision. Spain is currently fighting not only the Americans, but Philippine rebels on the island who are on the outskirts of Manila, surrounding the Spanish garrison there. Dewey will allow the Philippine leader, Aguinaldo, to be ferried from Hong Kong. That will prove to be a costly mistake. It doesn't take long for the music industry to respond to victory in the Pacific. Helen Frances Phillips writes a march just four days after a great American victory. Marie Margaret Points also writes a victory to the great admiral of the Pacific Fleet of the United States. It's published less than a month after the battle. And William Santelman, the German-born director of the United States Marine Band, composes the Admiral Dewey March and leads the Marine Corps Band in orchestrating the peace. There are at least a dozen composers and performers who produce versions of tributes and marches. To America's newest hero, the music for a moment, drowns out the questions about America's role in the world. As Theodore Roosevelt writes to a friend, there's a great many jingos now. Roosevelt was using a common pejorative term, with he, which he took as a bit of a badge of honor. It comes from an old play about the Russian-Turkish War where one of the characters sings, We don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do, we've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too.
The brief war between the United States and Spain could raise many questions, and as we'll look at in this episode, you could look at it. In the early months of 1898, there seemed to be nothing but upside. The United States was building a Pacific empire. Of course, not everyone agreed. Many called McKinley an emperor. Mark Hanna, senator, and President McKinley's right hand scoffed at that. President McKinley, William McKinley, an emperor? Are they kidding? This is not an empire. But it should be noted that it is during the Spanish-American War that the political question of the annexation of Hawaii is actually settled. Now, Grover Cleveland, president before McKinley, had blocked annexation of the island. A group of American businessmen, led by Sanford Dole, had established a republic on the island and overthrew the queen applied for statehood. Grover Cleveland blocked that, and so it remained an independent country for some time. When there was a vote in Congress to annex Hawaii, it had to be conducted as a treaty, therefore, because Hawaii is a country, and the Queen of Hawaii comes with a petition from 21,000 Hawaiians to Congress and presents it to them. Do not annex us. This republic that is in there is not ruling in the name of the people. And in February 1898, they successfully defeat a treaty vote on the floor of the Senate. That's mostly because a treaty vote requires two-thirds. Now that there is a war afoot, there's a new political reality. It's decided that a joint resolution of Congress will do. That only needs a majority. And it is approved in July 1898. For African Americans, America's enhanced appearance on the world stage was more bittersweet. On one hand, there were heroes from the Battle of San Juan and economic improvements that coincided with the war, which is, of course, preferable. For W.E. Du Bois, it was alarming, although he didn't agree with it. The one option that African Americans have had since before the Civil War and was talked about in the 1890s was to remove themselves from the country, to emigrate to Africa or some other place in the world that they might be welcome and they might have more political and economic opportunity. The Spanish War, the annexation of Hawaii and the Philippines now meant to Du Bois that no place on earth would be beyond the reach of segregationists and their allies. Where in the world will any be safe from brute force, he said. Du Bois took particular aim at Booker T. Washington and his view, where he said that African Americans should focus on themselves, on their own improvement and focus on economic improvement first, before political. That's great, Washington's theory, but it won't work. And it's not working, Du Bois said. Booker T. Washington's theories were caught in a triple paradox, according to Du Bois. Yes, we all want ownership, but it's impossible to protect property if one doesn't have proper voting rights. Washington's focus on African American self-respect is contradicted by his own apologizing and the acceptance of civic inferiority. You know, we can make too much of this rivalry, too, and certainly Du Bois sends a congratulatory note to Booker T. Washington about his speech in Atlanta. The two would like to see improvement. Most importantly, both recognize that they're up against a lot. But in many ways, Booker T. Washington's ideas were in the mainstream at this point. This is the decade where the movement to Oklahoma begins and land grants from President Benjamin Harrison, which are provided even to persons of color. And if we remember the tragedy that's going to unfold in 1921 in Tulsa, you should understand this is the beginning. The 1890s was when you first see the emigration of African Americans from other states, mostly from the South, into what was the Indian Territory and now the state of Oklahoma and setting up in the oil business and many other businesses. But Du Bois's point was taken. 
As the 1890s dawn, 1890 and 1891, these two years, right in the beginning of the decade, see new laws codifying the racism that many African Americans in the South felt. Now it was made force of law. Ten of the eleven Former Confederate states instituted laws, including poll taxes, grandfather clauses in Mississippi, were instituted to get around the 14th and the 15th. See, anyone can vote. That's no violation of the 15th Amendment. But if your grandfather couldn't vote, you had to take a literacy test and register. Well, this is just a way of avoiding color because most whites, their grandfather could vote. And the literacy test that they would get would be enormously difficult and also created so much opportunity for trouble at the local levels. Something else more subtle is happening through the laws, reducing the presence, the image of persons of color in public places. Louisiana becomes one of many states to set up a separate car bill to require separate sections of streetcars. They passed this in 1890. And... In Louisiana, and certainly in Mississippi, these type of laws might not have come as a surprise. In Arkansas, these changes are shocking. For those coming across the river from Mississippi, they see Arkansas as a paradise. This word is used, paradise, in African-American newspapers. One Arkansan town boasted of how rich some of its African-American citizens were. There's a business owner there worth $300,000. There are 11 African members of the Arkansas House of Representatives in 1890, and there's 70 members. There's violence everywhere in the South. There's vigilantism, there's lynchings. It's a a part of life, unfortunately, that all African Americans suffered from. But in Arkansas, as a newspaper said, particularly in northern Arkansas, Bentonville, Fort Smith, the races get along as well as anywhere in the North. A prominent Methodist bishop says that Arkansas could become the great African-American state of the country. A lot of people were talking about Oklahoma becoming this, but he's saying it's right here in Arkansas. Rich lands, healthy regions, less racial prejudice than anywhere else in the South. In Pine Bluff, an African-American from Mississippi arrives and writes in the Arkansas Freeman newspaper. I began bending my steps, and to my surprise, I found not the half had been told about this Arkansas paradise. I found persons of color representing almost every business profession. We went to the sheriff's office, and there found a person of color as a deputy sheriff, not acting, not some political token role. This is how it seemed, but hopes shattered quick when the state in 1891, under pressure from white supremacists, Democrats having recently been bested by populist labor rights, want to appeal to the white voter in Arkansas and come up with these issues. The 1890 Democratic Convention in Arkansas calls for a separate car bill. And when they get the legislature in 1891, they move forward. It prescribed government interference on personal liberty and even corporate liberty. They dictated if if it was a large company that had a separate car. Small companies could insert a port partition to separate whites from people of color. Opponents raised that it was illegal. Proponents said that it was based on a Mississippi law that was declared constitutional in the case of Texas Railway versus Mississippi. But that case only tested whether the federal government could get involved. At a protest meeting, Arkansas Baptist College President John Booker said that the bill would remove black and white from the public space, would lead to race humiliation. Senator George W. Bell of Desha County, the only black member of the Arkansas Senate, went back and forth with the segregationists in the chamber who wanted to pass the bill. And let me just insert here, when I'm saying the segregationists, I think this word has become abstract now. You know, it's just kind of like terrible, hating people. No, I mean, we're talking about the 1890s. We're talking about people who want to actually are at the point of instituting what segregation is. Where it had not been there, and that's the key, in many parts of the South had not been there before. People of color, he said, had been riding upon and within the same coaches in common with all other races for more than 18 years without any trouble. And in the House, in the Arkansas House, John Lucas argued that Arkansas and the South were going against 
mainstream opinion. It's going the opposite way. In Europe, they're becoming more tolerant. And it's against American values, particularly the value of liberty that's enshrined in everything. The legislature didn't care. The bill passed 72 to 12 in the House, 26 to 2 in the Senate. And this is, again, a state where there's pretty good, almost 20% representation, at least in the House, from African Americans in this state. Not enough after a compromise was made exempting Little Rock Streetcar and that company from this ruling. They even get the African American representative for Pulaski County, where Little Rock is, a Democrat, to vote for it, to vote for segregation. And then a white Republican, J.F. Healy of Searcy County in the north of the state, and what other white Republican would join to vote against it? His county, according to the Arkansas Freeman, had been aristocratic and quiet. And one of the great things about the prominent town in his county, the town of Searcy, was that it had this great park with wonderful sulfur springs. Many people felt that these springs were restorative to the health. The owner of the property gave it to the town with the intention of all free people, whatever race they were from, of using them. But we have a new chapter of race, hatred, and oppression, the Arkansas Freeman said. Some of our race-hating Bourbons from the back counties of Arkansas, the killing counties, the paper said came to visit the springs in Searcy and came to boarded hotels and see these healthy springs. Much to their disgust, there were African Americans at the park, and they had to share and drink from the same springs. Some of them went back to the hotel, and the horror, they refused to pay their board. The paper did more than hint that some of this was opportunism. The kind and considerate city fathers, the freemen said, hearing the complaints of the visitors and the hotel owners enacted ordinances that forbid the mixing of races at the park. A pipeline was built and a separate artificial spring was created for persons of color to drink from. There was also a fine, should we dare to drink at any other spring because of our hue. Arkansas changed in Pine Bluff where we talked about a veritable paradise. The color lines had shifted in politics. Soon the reverend, the bishop that had called Arkansas such a great place for people to move to, started encouraging African Americans to move to Oklahoma or back to Africa. And the legislator who fought the bill, Lucas, moved to Chicago. Hundreds joined them. So we could talk about, you know, getting fined, drinking from a spring or about separate streetcars. And it might You might seem trivial, it might be more significant to focus on violence, right? The lynchings, and there are 5,000 recorded lynchings, what's recorded between 1882 and 1927. 75% of these lynchings were of black people. And 80% of them are in the South. It's not just the South. Ohio has a large amount. And after one infamous case... Its governor, William McKinley, passes an anti-lynching law. That lynching law is a model for other states in the country. It has real teeth requiring prosecution and allowing the family to sue for damages. Legislatures would try in the 1890s to pass laws in New Jersey, West Virginia, Wisconsin, South Carolina, and Kentucky. Texas passes a law at first. Its populist governor, Big Jim Hogg, who wins with the support of all races, pushes the bill in his anti-lynching bill, and eventually in 1897 it passes. And it does contribute to a reduction, though not the elimination in any state, of this horrible practice. So we can talk about that. Real violence is the problem, but it's truly the razor's edge. For many, it starts with the other things. It starts with the voting laws, with the streetcar laws that makes them absent from the field of politics and absent from the public square. That makes the dehumanizing easy enough. And there are groups formed for civil rights. Some of them existed before the Niagara movement, the tail end of the decade, would really lead to the NAACP 
in New Orleans, Creoles and African Americans formed a group, a committee of Creole citizens, to try to combat some of these changes. One of their members was a shoemaker named Homer Plessy. And you could see a picture of Homer Plessy today, and you really couldn't tell whether he was a person of color or not. He described himself as seventh, seven-eighths white. And so he volunteered. Plessy was the perfect test case in a sense, since he had no physical property truly, which you seek to be so concerned with. Plessy's case would show how pure your motives are, how this is really a political criteria, an invented criteria, race, and the law should not permit it. Louisiana had passed a streetcar bill similar to Arkansas's. It did apply to streetcars in the city of New Orleans. Plessy went into a streetcar and sat in the white section. The conductor asked him if he was white. No. Well, you must go to the black section, Mr. Plessy. Plessy refused, and he was arrested. A plaque stands on the place in New Orleans where he was arrested. In the 1880s, see, Plessy could have gotten on that train. He could have also entered any school, entered really any building, go anywhere. Now he was arrested just for trying to board a train. A local judge spared him jail time, but upheld the decision against him and the law he was prosecuted under, freeing him and the Committee of Creole Citizens to go to state court and eventually to the U.S. Supreme Court. His lawyer expected that in this modern time, the 1890s, so far, from the Civil War, the 14th and 15th Amendments made the pathway clear of what you're supposed to do. This state of Louisiana and a few of these southern states were bad legal actors, and the federal government would correct them. He argued that the laws calling for separate but equal facilities were a sham. They weren't fair. They didn't meet the letter of what the 14th said of equal protection under the law. They perpetuate the stigma of color, and they turn one skin into an incurable curse. Plessy's lawyers were heard, but not listened to. The Supreme Court easily upheld the decision. The judge who wrote the decision actually argued that uh, the 14th Amendment did pass to make white and black legally equal, but not just as Henry Billings Brown said, and almost all of the rest of the court said, not socially equal. Brown also said states would be reasonable, voiding the necessity of federal intervention. We can trust these states. They're not rogue people. They're states of citizens, our fellow citizens. State police powers inherently were powers to be reasonable, not to arbitrarily use the power to deprive one class of rights. Well, you know, and look, before we knock Brown so much, you do have to consider that there might be some things that you like. Let's say gun laws or gun control laws. Let's say sanctuary cities, as they're called, issuing driver's license to people that other states say they won't issue, right? Let's say COVID-19, lockdowns, vaccines, everything else. You want a certain tolerance by the federal government of states. You want, in effect, the federal government to treat states as adults, not to assume that they're all going to be rogue actors and they have to be controlled by Washington, D.C. You get the point, but here's the problem. In the 1890s, it's exactly what these states were doing, trying to get around established rights. I don't have to tell you that. There was one member, and only one member, of the Supreme Court a justice from Kentucky, and from a slaveholding family, John Marshall Harlan, a Republican appointed by Rutherford B. Hayes, someone who considered in his decisions the impact on the economically disadvantaged. He says in his dissent, one of the most famous dissents in U.S. history, the 13th alone was designed to remove slavery or anything like it, anything that would constitute servitude. Separate accommodations in public are close to that. The 14th removed race lines from governmental systems. That's what it did. Equal protection under the laws. The court already said the law was the same for black as it was for white. He asked, why couldn't we allow cars to be discriminated against based on religion? Why couldn't we do it based on native-born people in this car, immigrants in this car? 
You almost want to say, Harlan, don't give them any ideas, but that was his argument. What would be next? And here Harlan nails it for future generations. In view of the Constitution and the eye of the law, there is no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here in America. Our Constitution is colorblind. The law regards man as man. This ain't 2021, this is 1898, and this justice was thinking this way. Harlan issued another prediction. This Plessy v. Ferguson case, in the opinion here, will go down with as much ignominy, and the court's reputation would be soiled the way it was with the Dred Scott case. The justice is shirked at that. But he was right. This from Edmund Morris, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt reached San Antonio on the morning of 15 May, 1898, wearing a new fawn uniform with canary yellow trim. The official name of the destination was Camp Wood, but a sign proclaimed, This way to the camp of Roosevelt's Rough Riders. There was a wave of disappointment among the recruits when he arrived at regimental headquarters. The big objection? was that he wore glasses. After years in Dakota, Roosevelt was used to this attitude, and if he felt mistrust in their stare, it did not bother them. He gazed back at them through the same offending lenses. He got to know their thousand names. Soon, he would memorize every one. Here was young Douglas Campbell, grandson of the men who had led cavalry up King's Mountain in 1780. Here was an Indian named Adair. Perusal of the muster rolls disclosed a Clark and a St. Clair, no Boone, but two Crockett's, and several apiece of Adams, Hamilton, and Jackson. The line between past and present must have blurred. He has lost his head. He means well, but it is one of those cases of aberration, desertion, vainglory of which he is entirely unaware. So said John D. Long, Secretary of the Navy, about the resignation of Theodore Roosevelt in the application for a position in the Army with Fitzburg Lee. Henry Adams also joined in. What on earth is this report of Roosevelt's resignation? Is his wife dead? Has he quarreled with everybody? Is he quite mad? Roosevelt is wild to fight and hack and hew. Of course, this ends his political career, said another. Even Cabot, his good friend, says this. Newspapers in the country urge Roosevelt to stay on in the Navy Department. You're number two, the most important military department of its time. And you want to go play in the mud. I mean, that's kind of the attitude that you get. Not Roosevelt. I have the Navy in good shape, he said. Long, his boss, is at last awake. The place hardly needs a map to explain it. The trails were like a pitchfork, with its prongs touching the hills of San Juan. The long handle of the pitchfork was the trail over which we had just come. The situation was desperate. Our troops could not retreat, as the trail for two miles behind them was wedged with men. They could not remain where they are, for they were being shot to pieces. There was only one thing they could do. Go forward and take the San Juan Hills by assault. General Kent's division, which according to the plan was to have been held in reserve, had been rushed up in the rear of the 1st and the 10th, and the 10th had deployed in the skirmish, or to the right. The trail was now completely blocked by Kent's division. Lawton's division, which was appeared to have reinforced on the right, had not appeared. To charge earthworks held by men with modern rifles and using modern artillery until after the earthworks have been shaken by artillery and to attack them in advance and not in the flanks are both impossible military propositions. But this campaign had not been conducted according to military rules, and a series of military blunders had brought 7,000 American soldiers into a chute of death from which there was no escape except by taking the enemy who held it by the throat. So the generals of divisions and brigades stepped back and relinquished their command to the regimental officers 
and the enlisted men. We can do nothing more, they virtually said. There is the enemy. That's the account of Richard Harding Davis. Colonel Roosevelt, on horseback, broke from the woods behind the line of the ninth, and finding his men lying in his way, shouted, If you don't wish to go forward, let my men pass. I speak of Roosevelt first because with General Hawkins, who led Kent's division, notably the 6th and 16th regulars, he was without doubt the most conspicuous figure in the charge. General Hawkins, with hair as white as snow, and yet far in advance of men 30 years his junior, was so noble a sight that you felt inclined to pray for his safety. On the other hand, Roosevelt, mounted high on horseback and charging the rifle pits at a gallop and quite alone, made you feel that you would like to cheer. And the thing about it is, is that Richard Harding Davis and Roosevelt were good friends. I have seen many illustrations and pictures of this charge of San Juan Hill, but none of them seem to show it just as I remember it. In the picture papers, the men are running uphill swiftly and gallantly, in regular formation, rank after rank, with flags flying, their eyes aflame, and their hair streaming, their bayonets fixed in long, brilliant lines, an invincible, overpowering weight of numbers. Instead of which, I think the thing that impressed one the most when our men started from cover was that there were so few. It seemed as if someone had made an awful and terrible mistake. One's instinct was to call to them to come back. You felt that some had blundered, and that these few men were blindly following out some madman's mad order. It was not heroic then, it just seemed merely absurdly pathetic. They had no glittering bayonets. They were not massed in regular array. There were few men in advance, bunched together, and creeping up a step, sunny hill. A steep, sunny hill, the tops of which roared and flashed with flame. The men held their guns, pressed across their chest, and stepped heavily as they climbed. The fire of the Spanish riflemen, who still struck bravely to their posts, doubled and trebled in fierceness. The crest of the hills crackled and burst in amazed roars. But the blue line crept steadily up and on, and then near the top, the broken fragments gathered together with a sudden burst of speed. The Spaniards appeared for a moment outlined against the sky, and poised for an instant fight, fired a last volley, and fled before the swift-moving wave that leaped and sprang after them. Soldiers are apt to recollect their wartime actions, writes Edmund Morris in The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, as poets do emotions and tranquility, imposing order and reason upon a dreamlike tumult. Roosevelt was honest enough to admit, even when minutely describing this charge up the hill, that at the time he was aware very little of what was going on outside the orbit of his ears and sweat fog spectacles. We're still putting Roosevelt in the center of most stories about the Spanish-American War, but up to an extent, he could belong there. Maybe not as much, you know, maybe not dominating that lens as much as we do, but he does seem to belong there. Had a role in starting it, had a role in being sure the Navy was prepared for it, had a role in starting a regiment that fights in it. There's a character that's in newspapers at the time, an Irish kind of cartoonish political observer, Odile Dooley, a time that said, Roosevelt should have had a book called Alone in Cuba. The way that all the descriptions went. And there's certainly a reality to this that is still true 120 years later. The reality is that he did contribute and is brave. I never saw braver men anywhere, said one of the Rough Riders, Frank Knox. John J. Pershing, then a lieutenant, said, they fought their way into the hearts of the American people. They were talking about the 9th and 10th Cavalry and parts of the 24th Infantry, who were Buffalo Soldiers, as they were called African American soldiers, who had been fighting the Comanche, other tribes out west, who were brought into the fight against the Spanish on land in Cuba, and some of the fiercest fighting that occurred at all in the Spanish-American War. During one landing at Tayabacoa, Cuba, Privates William Tompkins, Fitz Lee, Dennis Bell, and George Wanton saw 
how wounded U.S. soldiers and insurrectionist Cuban comrades were wounded and could not be rescued. Several attempts are made to rescue them by land, but there's too much fire. After several failed attempts, they're able to, under fire, get there in a rowboat and rescue the men. Each of them are awarded the Medal of Honor. Even Theodore Roosevelt, who had some less nice things to say at times about African-American soldiers, initially says, no one can tell whether it was the Rough Riders or the men of the night who came forward with the greater courage to offer their lives in the service of the country. He'd also say they were shirkers in their duties and go only as far as they were led by the white officers. This engendered a response from 10th Cavalry Trooper Presley Holliday. Mr. Roosevelt's statement was uncalled for, uncharitable. And considering the moral and physical effect of the advance of the 10th Cavalry had in weakening the forces opposed to the colonel's regiment, has done us considerable harm. Not every troop or company of colored soldiers who took part in the assaults was led or urged forward by a white officer. General William Schaefer, with his 15,000 men, including the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th in infantry, fought to the east of the city of Santiago. But San Juan Heights was taken by a force of 8,000 men, 13 regular army regiments under General Jacob Kent, which don't seem to get much credit in the story, not merely just Roosevelt's Rough Riders charging up the hill. Uh, Roosevelt's Rough Riders were one of two volunteer units as part of Kent's army. 1,250 African-American cavalrymen and soldiers that were part of Kent's right. Roosevelt's Rough Riders took Kettle Hill into fire, but somewhat less resistance. Troops almost out of ammo that they were fighting, fairly ready to retreat. And then he saw When he got to the hill, Kent's regiments overtaking San Juan Hill. Now, here's the thing where you must give Roosevelt credit. He could have stayed where he was and would have been right to hold that hill, securing it from uh, Spanish forces being able to then pour fire onto the Americans. He did not. He launched into the fire, sharp, vicious crawls through jungle terrain in the heat. At first, it takes some time. When he first tries to assist those attacking San Juan Hill, he charges out on horseback and finds there's only three Rough Riders with them. Takes some time to get everyone else. He does, and they reach the Spanish trenches to fight while there's still active resistance. Periodicals at the time mention the brave Buffalo soldiers. Professor of Black History, Rayford Logan, compared the 9th and 10th Cavalry the Buffalo Soldiers at San Juan Hill, to this generation's Jackie Robinson. They would be referenced with praise in both mainstream and African-American newspapers. There could be pictures, posters, or posters, or other mementos of the Buffalo Soldiers in the homes of African-Americans. There was a hope that this great sacrifice and bravery would lead to a new era. And, you know, there's something to say about the historiography of it, right? The previous history almost made it seem like it was only Roosevelt that took the hill. Then there are some corrections that made it appear like it was really only Buffalo soldiers who, and, you know, African-American cavalry units who took San Juan Hill. The reality, like most things, probably is Roosevelt's most contemporary account, that there was a lot of effort expended by all at the time. The Spaniards had been drawn from the heights surrounding the city of Santiago. They'd lost ammunition for their own artillery, and faced an American artillery assault and a Gatling gun. Fifteen Rough Riders were killed and 73 wounded. The regular army would lose 185, an indication by how much they participated in the battle. It's decisive, however. I mean, there's a few more days of action. The Spaniards don't surrender Santiago immediately. The decisive moment happens in the harbor, when the Spanish send their fleet out in search of reinforcements. They are bottled up and cannot escape. They try not to fight, but to outrun the U.S. Navy and fail. Among the ships set on fire, the Vizcaya, which once had been in New York Harbor. Afterwards, Roosevelt will campaign for a Medal of Honor. Roosevelt even gets his boss of the Rough Riders, a general in command of the Rough Riders, Leonard Wood, to recommend him. 
but Wood wasn't there during the charge. He asks his friend Henry Cabot Lodge, still a congressman, to help. Roosevelt writes to the War Department three months later, but he's informed that of the 50 applications, uh, they haven't been processed yet. In December, he tells his friend Lodge, forget it. But there is aggressive fighting in Cuba. When you get back to the Philippines, what happens is a deal is worked out between a Belgian diplomat and the Spanish, who are encircled by Filipino insurgents, that the Spanish will surrender to the Americans, but not the Filipinos. To make it look good, Admiral Dewey fires a few rounds, and the forces of General Merritt enter Manila without a single casualty. This is all to save the face of the Spanish. It's all been arranged in advance. The real battle is going to be between the U.S. and Aguinaldo, and in that battle, which lasts really from 1898, becomes a problem for McKinley in the 1900 election until he's able to calm down the situation in the Philippines, and is still going on after Roosevelt is president in 1902 before it's really quelled. That Philippine insurrection and the war between the U.S. and Filipinos, you know, is something that not everyone's aware of in history. The Ohio vs. the World podcast has a really good podcast on this topic. A lot of people, if they even know about it, think it was just a few months or something, don't know that it's still going on in 1902. And it takes 4,000 American lives. And when you read the accounts at the time, it's very much like a kind of Vietnam situation where people just shocked and surprised that they're losing American boys in a jungle that they just weren't even aware of. You know, the Spanish-American War looks very good on paper. When you look at just the straight-up casualties, it's in the hundreds. But when you add up the casualties of the Filipino insurrection and quelling that, and when you add up the deaths by disease, which in Cuba and in Florida where troops were stationed, there are something like 2,000 deaths. Uh, H.W. Brands, in his Reckless Decade, suggests that one of the real problems of the Spanish-American War is that Not that they sent too few troops, but that they sent too many. This was a time where you didn't want to have troops together in camp, in the mud, where there were mosquitoes, though they didn't know that that was the cause at the time. And 2,000 end up dying of disease, while only 300 or so die in battle in the Spanish-American War. When you add up the insurrection and the deaths by disease, and then you adjust it for population, say for modern times... You're getting something in the neighborhood. It's it's a war that costs 27,000 lives in, lives in our terms. And we know what that would feel like and what the reaction would be to that. Yet, the Spanish-American War is kind of like there's a little bit of a tax on imperialism and the like, but McKinley's as popular as ever. And there isn't the sufficient questions that one probably should have asked because there are long-term issues with imperialism and with America's stance. It's in September of 1898. They have to keep the army going for a while, just in case the Spanish start fighting again before the treaty signed, when the Rough Riders are dismantled. Roosevelt gives a speech. Officers and men, I really do not know what to say. Nothing could possibly happen that would touch and please me as much as this has. I would have been the most deeply touched if the officer had given me this testimonial, but coming from you, my men... I appreciate it tenfold. And then some of the troops shout, Three cheers for the next governor of New York! Roosevelt ignores it and asks the men to come forward and shake his hand. I want to say goodbye to each one of you in person. One of them says, Colonel, will you be our governor? Enough of that talk, he says. He would be New York governor the next year. There's a story from H.H. Colsat, the editor of the Chicago Times-Herald, a friend of President McKinley, who tells the story that in April 1898, he was traveling by train and he received a telegram from the president's private secretary, informing him to redirect his route and maybe come to Washington and see the president. I was too late for dinner. My train was late, but I was wired I would come as soon as possible. 
There was a piano recital in the blue room of the White House. Mrs. McKinley was seated near the pianist, looking very frail and ill. The president was in the center of the room on an S-shaped settee. There were 18 or 20 guest presents. As I stood in the doorway, some said, the president's trying to catch your eye. He motioned to me to sit by him and whispered, as soon as she is through this piece, go and speak to Mrs. McKinley and then go to the red room. I will join you. I did as requested. And when he had shaken hands with some of his late arrivals, we went into the red room. We sat on a large crimson brocade lounge. McKinley rested his head on his hands, his elbows on his knees. He was much in distress and said, I have been through a trying period. Mrs. McKinley has been in poorer health than usual. It seems to me I have not slept over three hours a night for over two weeks. Congress is trying to drive us into war with Spain. He broke down and cried like a boy of 13. I put my hand on his shoulder and remained silent. As he became calm, I tried to assure him that the country would back in any course he should pursue. He finally said, Are my eyes very red? Do they look like as if they had been crying? I must return to Mrs. McKinley at once. So this story, I believe, did not happen. It's not that Cole Sat was a total crank, but he ha does have a past history of also sort of misrepresenting McKinley on the money position before he got the nomination, being a little bit of an overzealot of the hard money position that eventually uh, McKinley would gravitate to Cole Sat's position and more, but he did it a little faster than Hannah or McKinley would like. I don't find evidence of it. I believe that uh, while McKinley did avoid war, once the Spanish were being intransigent and Congress was settled and a lot of American opinion was settled, helping the Cubans in one way or another, which would lead to either a war or increased presence, at least on the Caribbean stage for America, was inevitable. And it wasn't something that McKinley was going to cry over. There's a similar anecdote about McKinley up awake at night about whether to annex the Philippines or not. Neither of these, we think they were normal presidential decisions. I join with Bob Murray, um, author of President McKinley, who was on the podcast on this. It's just a way to tell the story of kind of a democracy trying to settle how it has possessions ownership of lands that aren't in its usual territory. Like imperialism just kind of happened, is the story we like to kind of tell ourselves. But the reality is, all the way to 1945, America had the possessions of the Philippines, a large landmass, and the possession of the Hawaiian Islands and Guam and several related Pacific Islands, enough to really control the destiny of the Pacific. And if we did not do it, the Germans or the Japanese would be uh, in line. Probably the Philippines, as they eventually did, would have been attacked by the Japanese. The Hawaiian chain. You know, think about it. When we talk about Hawaii, we're thinking of just a few islands. But actually, there's over 100 islands in the Hawaiian chain. And not only that, when you consider all of those islands... The actual chain goes from New York to Dallas. That's how long it is. And then take that, add to that the fact that America has 750 overseas military bases in 80 countries. And it's hard not to disagree with some scholars who say we do indeed have an American empire. Daniel Immerwar is probably the foremost of this, How to Hide an Empire, and his book does remind us of how much, um, I'm one that didn't need as much reminding. The town in New Jersey, where I, I'm originally from, has a fairly large Filipino population. Many of them came in the 80s after Marcos and after the, 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 the fighting there. And they were very often reminding people in the town that, remember, when MacArthur said, I will return, he was talking about the Philippines and the people he was speaking to were the Philippine people who then were residents of a U.S. territory, being taught English in, in, in American schools and fighting alongside MacArthur both on the retreat and the eventual conquest by the Japanese and then the return and the takeover of the Philippines. 
the Philippines would be granted its independence at the insistence of Franklin Roosevelt um, in the American tradition of, of, of wanting to limit colonies across the world. Uh, there's also something that Immer War Apart points out in his book that's not commonly known that on December 7th, 1941, we say Pearl Harbor was attacked, and that's true. But the initial reports are Pearl Harbor and the Philippines were attacked on that day. In the initial statements, both are considered part of the United States. But what survives in history, and yes, what was in specifically Roosevelt's speech, he wanted to take it a little closer to an attack on the U.S. mainland to make us feel it, and he brought up Hawaii. Imawar brings up the Democratic Party platform from 1900, asking this question of the dominant policy. No nation can endure half-republic and half-empire. Imperialism abroad will lead quickly and inevitably to despotism at home. This is something we didn't bring up yet, but is very common in the debates about the run-up to the Spanish-American War. If an army is created, we'll never lose that army. You know, we'll never take the handkerchief off Roosevelt. Nobody said that, but that's what they're thinking. We build up an army. Particularly, this was a feeling in the Democratic Party at the time. A democracy shouldn't have any colonies, said the Anti-Imperialist League. And it was serious stuff. These questions still haunt us today a bit. The history textbooks glance over the Spanish-American War. They glance over the casualties, which, as we've indicated, you know, would have been some, pretty high in our, in our time if you add up all the, the deaths by disease, which in any modern, uh, if this were a war going on today, of course they'd count the deaths by disease, not just those by bullets, if, if so many people had been lost. The action of, of getting involved in the Spanish-American War had cost then, questions later, made us exposed and vulnerable to Japanese attack in 1945. On the other hand, as author Bob Mary suggested in um, his interview with me, if you don't annex Hawaii and didn't have the Philippines as a station, what's next? Japanese already had influence in those areas. They take them over and they've got the launch pad to the mainland United States and California. Also, do you have growth in the western part of the United States? You know, San Francisco is fueled by the Pacific trade. So, there's all of these questions, and uh, I don't propose to have answers, but I do raise them. And we're reaching a point in America now where we've just ended a 20-year war in Afghanistan and then inclusive of that in the middle of Iraq. Both were highly questioned. Not the operation to get bin Laden, who had uh, planned and executed the World Trade Center attacks, 9-11. Not that part. And not even, you know, some covert operations or drones or things that are going on, um, intelligence forces, but the 20-year war. How much of this history, the Spanish-American War, is in that today, is embedded in that? When we think about Roosevelt as a hero, which a lot of times in history, both Republicans and Democrats really like Theodore Roosevelt in a lot of ways. Democrats, today's Democrats, maybe because of some of his progressive ideas, a lot of which came off in his unsuccessful presidential race of 1912 and not as much when he was president, but nonetheless, some were there. Establishment of food and drug regulation, conservation. But more than that, it's not his political stances that make Roosevelt popular. It's that he was an action guy and almost everyone on all sides wants that in their presence. They're always looking to Roosevelt. But when you had it, in effect, when George W. Bush really made that his mantra, when Dick Cheney, you know, according to reports, had the 1% doctrine that if there's a 1% chance of something occurring, you have to act as if there's 100%. You know, just a, a geared towards action, did that get us to a kind of increased imperialism that led us to Iraq and Afghanistan? Worthy questions. Worthy questions as we face the age that we're in. On the other hand, what do you do without imperialism? Or, as Daniel Immerwar kind of nicely puts it, a pointillist empire. In other words, not as much of a need to control swaths of territory, but control of points all around the world, including all of those military bases, so that American power could be projected when needed at different points of the world. 
without the influence of our democracy. But it's interesting. Emmer War points out, and I think it's picture the map of the United States in your head, that image, right? And it's that big, long, connected image, Florida on the bottom, rounds up, and then a straight line with Canada on the top, right? Well, there's Maine in the northeast corner. And he said, that is actually only been the United States for a few years in the 1850s. <laughs> you have to add Alaska, you have to add Hawaii, um, at a certain point the Philippines, then you take it away, certain islands are taken and then given away. But what would happen if we didn't have all of this, right? If we Would we be ceding to other people? For instance, it's very common to think of American overseas bases. But what about other countries? I mean, even Canada. We don't think of Canada as this like world military power. They have bases in Jamaica, in Kuwait, Senegal. There's an operational support hub in Germany. These aren't unwelcome by the countries. They're, they're beloved in some cases by the countries that have them as an additional security point. Same with the U.S. bases. China has bases in Myanmar, Djibouti, and in Tajikistan. And I don't think that's the end of it for that country. France also has a base in Djibouti, in the UAE, in the Ivory Coast, in Senegal, in Germany, in Chad. Greece has a base in Kosovo, as does the United States. India has bases in Tajikistan, an Air Force base. Bhutan, a training base. Madagascar, a radar facility in that case. The Netherlands has bases in their former colonies of Aruba and Curacao in the Caribbean, but also a detachment training base in Arizona. I mean, it's not huge. I'm not afraid of a Dutch takeover of Arizona anytime soon. Again, we're talking about not just force being projected upon people, although it's commonly politically made to be that way, but also a kind of both ways. It's a sharing relationship. Russia has bases all over the world. Eritrea, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Madagascar, Central African Republic, Sudan and Syria, Mozambique, Saudi Arabia, bases in Bahrain and Yemen, Singapore, Turkey has bases in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Azerbaijan, Kosovo, Libya, the British Army has a garrison in Germany, in Estonia, in Brunei, in Qatar, in Norway and Singapore. Um, the point being is this, there are many countries with overseas bases, there could be a lot more as the United States recedes from power. So these aren't easy questions, and I'm not a simple person telling you to close all the bases around the world, stop being the world's policemen and the like. Um, but we do look at the genealogy of the this, and there's certainly... And there, I, I come at it two ways. One, I'm inclined to say that the Spanish-American War leads to an increase in American interventions. It really does very quickly. There's a number of interventions, you know, really in the next 20 years for the United States. Dominican Republic, Haiti, um, Mexico, China. But I'm also inclined to say that if we go deep back, there had always been an eye on acquiring more things, particularly at first in the Caribbean, but also Hawaii. So it was accelerated with the Spanish-American War, not only taking on uh, ostensible European power, Spain, but something that we didn't talk about much but should now is the relaxation of opposition from the rest of the European powers. The United Kingdom made it clear. The French made it clear. The Germans made it clear. They would have no interest on siding with Spain in this quarrel. And that seeding of the issue by the European powers, you know, also helped the United States to get where it was and increased its presence on the world stage by their inaction. The only ones that supported the um, Spanish cause in Europe were the Austrians, who, of course, um, you know, the Queen Regent was a, a Habsburg. But that wasn't going to help them much. But... Is it worthwhile to go back to the Democratic Party platform of, of 1900 and say, yeah, can a nation be a Republican also hold possessions? It's something we've managed to do now. 
for a hundred years. It hasn't been easy. Um, we're a few years removed, but not many. There was just a pardon of, of a man who went and bombed France's tavern in New York City in the cause of Puerto Rican independence. They also tried to kill the president of the United States, Truman, in the cause of Puerto Rican independence. Uh, hasn't always been easy. And we've sort of swept it under the rug and gotten away with it. And maybe we need to look at it. How can you, in a republic, keep these territories for so long without allowing them to influence your politics? And of course, I go back to the shining example is our capital, where presidents since the 1840s have pointed out these guys have no rights and should. That Imrawar and his book, How to Hide an Empire, I mean, at times I don't agree with everything, but I think his illumination of the issue is important. The map of the United States isn't what we think it is. It has a lot more. And what we've managed to compromise is, at least since 1959, is we don't make anything else any part of the influence of the republic, but we continue to protect or own them. Delving into the 1890s brings these issues up. It's time to go and the passengers are excited. They gather in this giant, well-sculptured lobby of the spaceport. It's huge. For some of them who have never been to the European opera halls, this is like the biggest, most ornate building they've been to. A signal indicates that they are ready to board their ship for their ride. This ship is going to a very unique place. It's going to the moon. And as they wait in the Pan American Conference in Buffalo in 1901, along with 400,000 people who will go there, including the President of the United States, special displays will instruct them about how their spaceship functions, what they should expect when they leave Earth's atmosphere. A lot of them, it's not just their imagination. Anyone who had read Jules Verne's classic novel, very popular, A Trip to the Moon, or the many plays based on it, would know at least the story of shooting a container up to the moon with human beings in it. Frederick Thompson, an architect, is inspired, and he creates a unique spectacle called A Trip to the Moon for this Pan-American exposition. I had several ideas in my head, he said, all of which were unsatisfactory until I hit on this idea, an airship. Where will I take the airship, though, he said. I'll take it to the moon. It's as large as anything anyone would have been through at this time. It's 80 feet high. It's 40,000 square feet. It's one and a half times the size of Carnegie Hall. It costs 84,000 in in 1901 dollars to construct. You could build a house for 2,000. And if you paid 50 cents, which is also a Pretty good amount of money. It's basically like you have to pay like $35. You could go on this 30-seat spaceship named Luna. It looked like a cross between a blimp and a steamer. And it has these enormous wings that flapped. You know, not like an airplane, which are straight. This is before planes, but actually... They flapped like a bird's wings. That was worked by systems of pulleys. And the writers can't see that. There's also hidden fans that create the sensation of wind. And moving canvas backdrops provide the effect of clouds passing by. First, you see the exposition. It's so detailed. The whole exposition is is in drawn in detail. It mirrored on this canvas. So they actually see the lighted exposition, which is already something in itself as they float into space. Quickly, and you see the Earth, at first very large and then very small. Light is reduced, there are sound effects that add to the whole thing. It's not without its issues. There's a terrible, rocking, electric storm that that makes the airship shake, but they get through it and land in a lunar crater. And the passengers are encouraged to get off. 
They go through a maze that looks like a cave. And there, they are greeted by aliens called Selenites, who of course are actors dressed in costumes, who guide the space travelers through the maze and to a room where they can actually try samples of green cheese and meet the king of the moon. There's also, of course, just like there might be today, a souvenir shop where they can buy things. Go to the palace of the man in the moon, and there's a spectacular stage show with illuminated fountains. The return to Earth is not too much fun. Passengers are shown their way down on a rope ladder. Show must go on, and the next crew comes in. Each time that the Luna takes its passengers on, there's the sound of a gun and the rattle of an anchor chain that is heard throughout the exposition. President William McKinley has never been more popular. America is prosperous. We've entered, we're about to enter a new century. See, they thought it was 1901 then. America was a very different country than it was when it took office in 1897. McKinley rises, makes a speech. To the commissioners of the Dominion of Canada and the British colonies, the French colonies, the republics of Mexico, the Central and South America, and the commissioners of Cuba and Puerto Rico, who share with us this undertaking, we give the hand of fellowship and facilitate with them upon the triumphs of art, also science, education, and manufacture, which the old has bequeathed to the new century. Expositions are timekeepers of progress. They record the world's advancement. And as such, instruct the brain and the hand of man. Who can tell us the new thoughts that have been awakened? The ambitions fired and the high achievements that will be wrought with this exposition. Gentlemen, let us ever remember that our interest is concord, not conflict, and that our real eminence rests in the victories of peace, not those of war. Out of this city may come not only greater commerce and trade, but more essential than these, relations of mutual respect. As he finishes that speech on September 5th, 1901, at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, there is a roar of cheers. And one can almost picture that they're not just cheering a president, but an American decade. This is part four and the final of our series on the 1890s. I hope you enjoyed it. We packed a lot in to four episodes. Other decades in American history are also important. The only reason to isolate something is to study it more. The 1880s are important. The 1900s, 1910s, 1930, all important. But once in a while you want to focus on certain eras and this we did. I encourage you to go back and listen to it because there's a lot there. And maybe you picked it up all, maybe you picked up all of it, maybe you did not. I encourage you, if you liked it, to maybe take this series to recommend My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast to a friend that you know enjoys history with some focus on politics. 
We do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash M-H-C-B-U-Y-P. The My History Can Beat Up Your Politics patron. I'm probably going to talk more about the 1890s and kind of putting together what all of it means, but I think some of it is obvious. If you went through these series, you'll see the connection to what was on then and what it means today. And I thank you for listening. <laughs>